Cinity, your digital cinema tech resource, supported by B and H and CVP. Hi, I'm Grammy Lewis Sheldon, and welcome to Cine D. Today, I'm going to chat with a friend of mine, Kevin Stiller. Kevin is an LA-based director of photography, and you might know his work from shows like Dimension 20 and Game Changer. He has spent several years diving into a bug, or the good folks at Apple might call it a feature, related to Mac devices that's sometimes been referred to as the QuickTime Gamma Bug, or simply discussed around frustration with colors changing after export. Trust me. If you think about color in cinematography and use a Mac device, you will want to stick around for our conversation. Kevin, you and I chatted, I don't know, a couple weeks ago at this point um, over Zoom, and you ran me through some of the things that you had discovered um, about the QuickTime Gamma Bug. But I think a good place to start would be let's define this sure. because it has different names all over the internet. But I think this is something that most of us have seen at one point or another. So Definitely. let's start there. What what are we talking about? Sure. So people do call it the QuickTime Gamma Bug, and that is unfortunately not a super accurate way to name it because it does go deeper than that. Um, the real proper way to look at it, it all boils down to color management. Uh, and while the emphasis of today is mostly focusing on Apple devices, namely Mac OS, color management affects all devices everywhere. Uh, what Apple is doing on Mac OS, there is color management happening under the hood, and it is intentional. Everything that they're doing is correct, and so when we call it a bug, uh, that's not technically correct. It's just that as filmmakers, we're not getting the image that we anticipated when we were in our editors and doing um, doing color correction and color grading. Yeah. So, so you know, most commonly, where do we see this? bug at what point in the production process, so to speak? You're going to encounter seeing this when you are on a Mac OS device with a Apple display and you are exporting something out of your editing software, whether that was Premiere um, or if you're working in DaVinci, um, you're going to probably think that what you see is what you get in your program monitor. And when you export that and then you compare that footage to what you're seeing on your screen, you're gonna see some differences. And I can show you uh, what I mean by that uh, on my computer right here. Okay, let's do it. So I have here uh, an example, and this is just a really stock Premiere project. There is nothing fancy happening here, and I do want to emphasize this is an M1 MacBook, so relatively up to date. This is a P3 display. I am in the stock display that comes on this computer, which is an important note. Um, so I'm going into this under the assumption that this is kind of out of the box. And this is what most people that are delivering for web or content creators uh, are going to be working with. Uh, now, when you, of course, address situations like when you're working on a, on a larger budget film and you have a reference monitor and you're working in a color house, those pipelines still change. Uh, but at the end of the day, this all will still loop back to what's happening at Mac OS. And I, I'll show you, uh, we'll, we'll get under the hood there. Uh, so I'll go ahead and hit that export tab. And I'm just gonna export this in ProRes 422 because it's a codec that many people are familiar with. And I'm just gonna call this just export. Um, and settings are gonna be pretty straightforward. I'm rendering this out in 3840 by 2160. Uh, really, truly these settings don't matter. What matters here is that I'm just exporting it out of the gate, out of Premiere. So I hit that export button, let and that go. This kind of export process should feel very familiar to everybody. Sure, of course. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so now if I go ahead and open that file, uh, let me find that there. I'm gonna go ahead and double click that. And let's take a look at this side by side with, your, with what we have in the Premiere window. And now you can see some pretty notable differences, right? So. If I look at our Premiere window versus what I see in QuickTime, we're seeing some desaturation, especially on the skin tones. Or if you look at the details in her shirt, we're seeing a lot of loss of oranges. Um, so strong primary colors are clearly desaturated, especially in, in the greens of this, the greens of the candle here. Um, yeah, so a loss of, of saturation and also a change in perceived brightness. So we kind of look at the shadow detail here and it looks like the shadow levels have raised up and the midtones of her face, take for instance, like the shadow side of her face looks lifted. And so people describe this as 
washed out um, and they see this happen in QuickTime. So they say, it's a QuickTime bug, it's QuickTime is washing out. If you just Google QuickTime washed out, QuickTime bug, um, or after, or, mm, or Premiere uh, washed out, Export washed out, Kodak washed out. Uh, there are many names for there, this thing. Yeah. There are so many. And I am here to tell you um, a couple key things. Uh, this is not QuickTime. Um, it is not Preview. It's not Chrome. Uh, it is something called Color Sync Utility, which is running as a framework on the backbone of all Mac OS operating systems. And for the nitpicky people out there, technically, the actual real culprit, if you will, is known as AV Foundation, which is the framework that Mac OS is running deep behind the scenes to render and draw video content on our screens for us. And so the way that they're interpreting these colors and this video information uh, via the help of the software Color Sync is going to be doing this for us behind the scenes. And what's, I think, extra annoying about this is if you look at it, it looks 9% different, right? It's not, everything's not blue, it's yeah. not magenta, it's not 50% different. Right. It's just enough to really grit, get in your craw and drive you insane sure. and think you're losing your mind. Yeah. So yeah. I see this all the time and I try to compensate by just having the most expensive monitors on set or in post and thinking that I've messed something up along the way. Yeah. Or so, okay, you've kind of defined what this thing is. Um, why, why did Apple do this as a company? Did they have a good methodology initially at least? So. The, the thing that's so fascinating about this is that even though it looks like a glitch or a bug, there is intention behind it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and truly, as I referenced earlier, this really does come down to color management and understanding what is going on truly behind the scenes. And the way to really break this apart is to talk about this in layers. So what's happening is two things separately, but come together as color management. So number one, we talked about a desaturation of colors. So the loss of primary colors seem to be desaturated. Number two being a change in overall brightness. So I wanna talk about first, the, the first one being color. Uh, and I'd like to show you uh, using this handy dandy chart that many of us have probably seen before, uh, the CIE chromacity chart. And so uh, this chart is a lovely description of what the human eye is capable of seeing. And we see here there's something called sRGB Rec 709. Rec 709 is a good buzzword for us because Rec 709 is typically a delivery format that we work towards. In fact, the cameras that are shooting this right now are literally set to a profile called Rec 709. Now, Apple's monitors are in Display P3. So if you take a look at the P3 color space, you can see that it is larger than Rec. 709. It sees mostly a lot more in the greens and the reds. Uh, and that's, the one, uh, that's a very important distinction. Our monitors by default by stock shipped by Apple are in a P3 color space. And that means that any content that is rendered um, or authored as Rec. 709 needs to be converted so Apple needs to rely on something on the fly to manage all of the pixels in Mac OS at all times. And what it's doing is using Color Sync to do that. Color Sync sees every single pixel on the screen and says, it should be this, it should be this, it should be this. It, when a program opens and sees a file that's tagged as Rec. 709, it thinks, okay, gotcha. Rec. 709, I'm, I'm on a P3 display. This content is Rec. 709. I'm gonna convert that down for you. So the colors that you're seeing when you open your video in a color managed application, when I say color managed, it means Color Sync is able to see it and communicate with it, meaning QuickTime is color managed. It can communicate to Color Sync and say, that's a Rec. 709 piece of footage. Uh, preview, when you open something with Spacebar, Preview is color managed. Uh, Safari and Chrome have the ability to be color managed. So when you open in QuickTime, colors are converted, those colors are desaturated, those are actually the correct colors of your video. If you open a Premiere file and you're looking at the program monitor on a P3 display and you shot footage with the intent of it being Rec. 709, you are unfortunately objectively seeing the wrong image in Premiere. Uh, and that is because you're monitoring it with a P3 color space. 
Step two is, I think, the, the deeper rabbit hole that I want to get into, which is when we're talking about how things look washed out, uh, how the brightness levels have changed. And this is where we're, we're running into an issue and I think is truly impacting content creators and even people watching content at home that don't realize they're being affected by this. So Color Sync did the right thing with our colors, but there's a trick that's happening with specifically Rec. 709 footage. When a color manage application opens a file, and as I mentioned, that's QuickTime, that's preview, it's not every program. VLC, for instance, is not color managed, so you'll see something different VLC. Anyways, in a non in a color managed application, when it can identify that your footage is Rec. 709, which is anything exported out of a nonlinear editor, so DaVinci, Premiere, they all export Rec. 709 unless you specifically have set up anything else. And then Color Sync says, "Hey, I see Rec. 709. I know how to decode that." And they are assuming that the gamma of that video file has been encoded as a gamma curve of 1 over 1.961. 1.961, oddly enough, this is going to sound crazy, it's correct. If you look at the white papers for Rec. 709, which was built in the 90s, so Apple says they're playing nice by looking at the white papers and saying, this is, this is correct, this is what we have written. But in 2011, Rec. 709 was amended to be BT 1886, which correctly identified that video content is meant to be critically looked at in a reference environment with a Gamma 2.4 monitor. And so if you look at, basically, if I were to say, what's the most current form of Rec. 709, that would be saying, well, we want to look at something as Gamma 2.4 on a 2.4 display. All of our monitors on set do that. We all do 2.4. Uh, but Apple hasn't quite caught up with that, so they're still decoding our footage using 1.96. So when that conversion happens, you are left with a resulting gamma conversion that isn't based on the gamma that us professionals typically encode our footage with. It's actually a gamma that is since deprecated and we don't really frequently use anymore. And I, I will say there is a lot of history to that number and we could talk for hours about it, but for really to, to simplify it and for all intents and purposes, we don't ever use 1.961 to encode our images anymore. It's just something that doesn't happen. I mean, they took a big swing with that. I often watch stuff not at a Starbucks sitting in the corner with the ambient light levels being nuts. Yeah. It's, it's really the, the technical of it is they, they assume that you encoded the footage as 1.96 and then they transform it to the display space. And after that transformation, you're left with that brightened image. And, and it's all based on they're removing the dim surround compensation, they're referencing a gamma value that is non-standardized. Um, but in, in with all that being said, they can still technically say that they're following spec, which they technically are. You mentioned Apple is sort of basing their Rec. 709 math on uh, like math from the 90s, essentially. Why do you think they're doing that specifically? Sure. So in the 90s, Rec. 709 was made uh, with the assumption that you're watching content on a CRT monitor in a dimly lit environment. That's what we had in the 90s. Uh, when Rec. 709 was then made, the mathematical way of arriving at a system gamma of 1.2 is by encoding your image with gamma 1.96. Now that's a lot of mathematical jargon, but what I'm ultimately saying is the best way to reproduce what your eyes are supposed to see on a CRT monitor in a dimly lit room is by encoding your image as 1.96. So I wanna sum up for you what I just said in a bite-sized way. If you go to developer.apple.com, they do have a section in regards to the way that they interpret content that is tagged as Rec. 709. You can actually see here that they say the system uses a 1.961 gamma based on the assumption of a bright surround environment. Bright surround environment is a very critical term here because it alludes to something known as the simultaneous contrast effect. The simultaneous contrast effect is sort of a glitch in human perception that refers to how a shade of gray can look completely different based on the surround viewing environment. So you can see this shade of gray appears brighter when surrounded by darkness 
then the exact same shade of gray when surrounded by an area of brightness. And you can see if I bring up a digital color meter, I can actually hover over this and read a value of 90, 90, 90, and the same on this side. They are exactly the same shade, even though they are perceived differently. So what Apple is doing is they are still referring to gamma 1.96 from the original Rec. 709 white papers, but instead of referring to that value as how it was originally designed, which was for CRT monitors in a dim environment, they remove that contrast enhancement that we were talking about and instead assume a bright viewing environment. And so they are making the content that we're watching much brighter because when you are in a very, very bright environment, then perceptually it should look the same as when you are in a Rec. 709 Gamma 2.4 environment. But the issue here is that most people are not using their laptops in an environment that is that substantially brighter in order to have that perceptual match. Well, but I mean, you can come to a place, I guess, that now that you know, this is what um, Mac OS, ColorSync, this is what's happening, at least you know now. Yeah. And you can grade for somewhere that ends up between ColorSync and Mac OS and say just, you know, Android devices or whatever. So my, my best recommendation for people is number one, knowing about this. That's, that's so huge uh, because when you see that content, when you do that side by side, you can get so lost in thinking it's the codec, it's the player. Just know your file is okay. Number two, do your absolute best to bypass the operating system and color grade on a reference monitor. What we can do though as content creators is be aware of this problem and target who we want our audience to be. Who do we want to be optimally seeing the image that we're trying to show? We can do this in Premiere and DaVinci. And as a reminder, this is specifically if you are on an Apple computer in Mac OS and you don't have access to a reference monitor, you are using a stock Apple display from approximately 2015 onwards. Let's dive in. If you're in Premiere and you go to the Lumetri Color, tab over to Settings, this is the most updated version of Premiere. You wanna make sure you are on that. And then you wanna take a look at Display Color Management. If you toggle that on, that allows Premiere to become a color managed piece of software and interfaces with the preset that you have set onto your displays. In this instance, I'm on an XDR display on a MacBook M1 and that is using a gamma transfer function of sRGB, which is traditionally 2.2, and it's set to P3 color. Because I've enabled display color management in here, and it sees that my timeline is Rec. 709, it's transforming our P3 colors to Rec. 709 colors, and then we have the ability to change our viewer gamma. So if you take a look, I can set that to be 2.4, for instance, for television, 2.2 for web, or 1.96 in parentheses QuickTime. Now, when you see QuickTime in here, what that is really referring to is quote unquote, the Mac OS AV foundation framework, but that's probably too much to fit in the parentheses. So they're calling it QuickTime, which is fine. That is a little bit self-explanatory as just being Mac OS. As we mentioned, Mac OS is currently the only operating system that decodes Rec. 709 as gamma 1.96. Now, if we look at the program monitor, and the actual exported file, you can see that our program monitor is much more accurate to what our QuickTime file is showing us. And that's because, like I said, we've enabled display color management and we're now matching that transformation that is happening on Mac OS. If it were me, my recommendation would be to put this in 2.2 for a couple reasons. Number one, traditionally, I'm assuming if you're a content creator without a reference monitor, you're most likely outputting your content for web and most web gamma 2.2 is kind of that Goldilocks gamma. 2.2 is a very safe number and it's also the default gamma that this display profile is using. So if you're enabling 2.2, put yourself in a quote unquote 2.2 reference environment with some ambient light and that will really allow you to have probably the best case scenario. You're going to be seeing some gamma shift between QuickTime and here but it's the closest Goldilocks that we can possibly get to having this file being shown as best as you can across all devices. If you specifically want to target optimal viewing in Mac OS, for instance, QuickTime or Safari in Chrome, 
then you can enable Gamma 1.96 and see it exactly as it will be showing it in that scenario. As a triple reminder, this is Mac OS specific. So if you grade or color against this look, and for instance, you think this is too bright and you want to darken it, that means it will look even darker on Gamma 2.2 or Gamma 2.4 devices. If we want to accomplish this in DaVinci, it's also pretty straightforward. You want to open your preferences in DaVinci Resolve. You want to go to General and toggle on Use Mac Display Color Profiles for Viewers. This is enabling the same thing as when you toggle that button, Display Color Management. Go ahead and hit Save. If it's your first time enabling that setting, you do want to close and reopen DaVinci. Then you want to tab over to your settings and take a look at the, your output color space. Right now I have it to Rec 709A. The A in this instance stands for Apple, which is the same thing that you saw in Premiere as 1.96 parentheses QuickTime. As you can see, if I toggle this back over to Rec 709 Gamma 2.4, this is the 2.4 reference response, whereas Rec 709A is the quote unquote QuickTime response. And again, as before, we can put these side by side and see that they are much closer to being the same. I, I realize we're kind of bringing it to a close in a place that could be semi-annoying. Like I wish, you know, we fully fixed this at this point, but I would argue that A, great job, Kevin. You, um, you know, put a name to a thing that I have seen all over the internet for years and years and years and years. And you stopped people from going down just this, this spiral of, of just trying to figure out what part of my workflow is, is broken. Yeah. So, Thank you for that. Thank you. I and appreciate it. The answer is, you know, reference monitors. It's it's reference not monitor. thinking that your five thousand dollar iMac is, is is the way to go on with everything color related. After taking into account reference display and a good philosophy, really at the end of the day, we just sort of have to hope that Apple will eventually, with a software update. Uh, come to more updated spec, which is that they would reference Rec. 709 content as BT1886 standards, which is that it should be decoded, assuming that it's been encoded as Rec. 709 Gamma 2.4. And then Apple totally has the liberty to transform that Gamma to a standard Gamma of 2.2, which is usually what laptops and computer displays are. And that would look super acceptable um, and I think most people in the industry, our industry would agree that that's about the degree of shift necessary to account for surround compensation. Okay, Kevin Stiller, thank you so much for doing a deep dive on this topic. Um, can we point some people to other reading materials they might find valuable if they wanna dig a yeah. little deeper on this? So the, the biggest ones that I would recommend for people that are especially interested in learning what gamma exactly is, I would highly recommend, uh, there's a website, cambridgeandcolor.com. Uh, and if you look at their gamma tutorials, they have a phenomenal, uh, very easy read description of what gamma correction is. They talk about gamma encoding, gamma decoding. And if those words are unfamiliar to you, it will clear a lot of it up in a light read. Uh, and then if you want to start to get deeper into it to really uh, go through the weeds, um, there's a guy named Charles Poynton who is a lead colorometry expert, color scientist, who defined, I believe defined what HD is. I think he literally invented HD. Uh, and, and so wrote a lot of the white papers about gamma and HD. Um, he has a very good blog on poynton.ca uh, forward slash notes. That's P-O-Y-N-T-O-N. -O -O uh, Charles Poynton is um, truly uh, brilliant and does explain all of uh, the concepts of color and gamma quite well on his website. Okay, so we'll put those links right below in the description. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe for more. Bye, everybody.